as we look forward to everything that was going on, but we'll have the, a good time of fellowship and a meal, and, and uh, I will have an abbreviated but gospel Christian type, Christ, uh, Christmas type of message uh, for it. So if you would want to bring someone with you, whether they're a Christian or not, or you're not sure, please bring them, and we will certainly make the gospel as clear as possible. Uh, without beating anybody up. Just try to get the word out there in that case like that. We're not trying to be uh, hard to get along with. We just know that we're... We have a little R&R at times, but we also have a lot of uh, edification, so that's great. And uh, so Ephesians chapter 2, I entitled this lesson, Have You Been Made Alive? Have you been made alive? I didn't get the emails out this morning because I left my jet pack at the house. Not, I didn't, not the one I put on my back. It's what people in the sticks have to use because we don't have broadband out here. For those of you who've never used a jet pack to understand, it's like a router that Verizon offers. And so I didn't bring it down with me, so I didn't have the access to send out the, that's my excuse for not sending out the uh, email with the church bulletin on it. I send that out. And anybody ever wants that, you let me know and I'll send it to your email inbox. But have you been made alive? This is part of our Ephesians study in chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. This is the 11th lesson. There's a long prayer, as we know, in this uh, book. And there's also before that uh, a long uh, introduction into all the many blessings that we have as Christians from verses 3 through verse 14, which is one sentence originally, one sentence, pretty long sentence. And in that sentence, a lot is said about our, our Father in heaven knowing where we that we would come to Christ in faith, that uh, he has a plan for those who come to Christ in faith. That's what predestination is. It's not for those who have not come to Christ. It's for those who are going to come to Christ of their own free will based on God knowing who will believe on His Son for salvation because God says, whosoever will may come. Anybody who wants to believe in Jesus Christ can believe in Jesus Christ. God doesn't force some into Christ and force others out. It's, he's an equal opportunity Savior, Jesus is. The Bible says He is the Savior of the world. Though not all believe in Him, He's the only Savior qualified to save. He's the only Savior. He's the only mediator between God and mankind. There's no other mediator. There's no works. There's no religion. There's no guru. There's no a, a spaceship you can jump in and get up there. Only in Christ... Do you have eternal life? And once you receive Him, you have eternal life. Once you receive Him, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, not to ever be blotted out. Once you receive Christ, you are eternally secure in the Lord. And you're also positioned for great inheritance in the Lord. Great inheritance. And of that inheritance, some of that inheritance is going to be spread out equally among all believers a new body, sinless as it may be, no more death, the joy of being in the presence of the Lord, a place to abide and joy, great company of saints and holy angels and the Lord Himself, no fear ever again of uh, judgment, no fear ever again of anything else, of dying or anything. There's a great, great family there. But then there's those who are joint heirs in Christ who have rewards that everybody can get, but there are rewards for reigning in service with Christ, a place of privilege that you have that you otherwise wouldn't have. It's based upon your faithfulness to the Lord in time. You've heard that over and over, but it's something that I can't overemphasize because the next big day in your life is not your death, but your standing in front of the Lord for your rewards. Same for me. And so you can't do anything for the the most part about the day of your death, but you can about 
the condition of your soul as you go to stand before the Lord. That's the way that gives you and I the power to do that. That's a wonderful thing. But Paul, after all this introduction down to verse 14, goes into verse 15 with a prayer that he had. And he said in verse 16, I cease not to give thanks for you. And he goes on and talks about the great privilege that we have in God and the wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Christ in verse 17 is what Paul wanted to impart to these believers. Now that you see that you are what you are in Christ, let me share with you the great thing that you need, and that is, verse 18, to be enlightened, to have understanding of the things of God. Not to be worker bees for God. Some believers think that if they're not constantly busy for God, that they're not good Christians. I'm going to tell you, sit down and listen for a while. We have too many ADHD Christians. And I'm not talking about a physical disability or whatever kind of a disability. I'm talking about a spiritual disability. And we can't feed that with some sort of a sugar pill of entertainment. Believers need to sit down and listen and learn like you do. But we're all challenged. I am particularly challenged. I'm one of the first ones that wants to hop up out of the chair when something comes to my mind when I'm in my study. I'm like Boomer. Every little noise I hear, I want to jump up and see what that is instead of focusing on the text. It happens. Pray for me. I need help. I need help. We know. So I wear earplugs. And that helps some. And now that my wife retired, the dog stays with her. So I don't, I don't have that problem. That's great. But the, Paul wanted the believer to know just how much joy that they had in learning and being enlightening and knowing the things of God and the riches of the glory of His inheritance and His saints in verse 18. And he wants us to understand that the power that is in God that is also manifest, was manifest in Christ on the earth, that same power is for you too, for me. We don't live a lifeless, weak life. We have the power of God abiding upon us. And verse 21, this is the fallen angels and Satan. That power that Christ has is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And so that's good for you to know that you have that standing in God too. And that Christ has everything under His authority, verse 22. All things have been put under His feet. That's a sign of His authority. And you are in Christ, so you have a right to live out the life that you're called to. And no one other thing or person or devil has a right to call you to live under any other authority, whether it's government, whether it's religion, whether it's just good works as far as a replacement for uh, salvation. You are in the authority of the word of the Lord and through understanding the things of God, he makes it really seem it pops for you. In other words, we saw uh, from our message the last time that we came into this world physically alive, yet spiritually dead, as he says in chapter two and verse one. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, hath he quickened or made alive in italics was added by the translators for a smoother reading. In verse 5, that is in the original text. But in verse 1, it is not. But you and you... And remember, they, Paul wasn't writing in chapters and verses. It was just a letter. When I've written letters to people before, I didn't write chapters and verses, though I did have paragraphs. Some. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which times past you and I walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. This is what he says, and he goes into chapter 2. And he's saying that our nature before salvation was one of an adaptation to the ways of the world. In other words, there were ways that we could we could we could justify appropriating appropriating things that God saw as inappropriate. We could justify in the light of trying to get along with our fellow man going along to get along. 
We could justify that. And we rightly did in order to be accepted among our peers. You do it in grade school, high school. Grown-ups do it too. We do a lot of things to be accepted of our cultural peers, of the people that we know. We don't want to look like the oddball, the outcast, the one that never gets invited to the party, the one that never gets offered the opportunity for the raise or the promotion. We don't want to be that oddball at the family dinner table, though some of us might be. We don't want to be. But if we don't go with the flow of the world, often we are looked at as that oddball, that stranger, that person that always shows up. Oh, she's here. <laughs> oh, here he comes. I see his car turning in the driveway. He's going to want to pray forever. But let's just put up with him. I wish he'd just come in and say, thank God for the turkey and shut up. Well, he's more thankful, or she in some cases is more thankful in they pray for more than just a piece of meat. <laughs> and that person's probably thinking, this might be the only time my loved ones will get to hear the gospel. I want them to go to hell, and I'm afraid they're going to hell. And let's not be afraid to use that word in our... And I don't mean uh, uh, in a bad way. But let people be aware that if they don't go to heaven, they're going to hell. It's gotten so much so that people nowadays will use the phrase, that other place. Call it what it is. When I go on vacation, I don't go to that other place. I'm going to the this or that hotel or whatever. But in when we were lost before salvation, it was our nature to appropriate that which was inappropriate. At least it was inside of us to do that. That's why our mothers perhaps would say to us, don't you shame me. Don't you, get, don't you mess up. Don't you do that. Don't make appropriate that which is inappropriate. But it was our nature to adapt to our culture, especially of wanting our own way and being our own master. We were raised in a world that was increasingly increasingly becoming more and more inappropriate in God's eyes. And culturally, it seems like it never really gets better. But at some point, we were convicted by God's Spirit, I was, you were, that you were lost, that you were dead in trespasses and sins. And you didn't want to go to hell when you died. I had a man who told me where I worked years and years ago, the early years I was there, who told me, so you only believed in Jesus Christ so that you wouldn't go to hell. Don't you think that was kind of selfish? I said, yes, it was. I said, do you want to go to hell? Do you think you're that good that you're not going to go? If you don't appropriate the grace of God, you will go to hell. At some point, we were convicted by God's Spirit that we were lost and dead in trespasses and sins. I can't convict you of that. Billy Sunday couldn't convict people of that. Charles Finney, who began the, 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 who started the idea of coming down the aisle, uh, couldn't convince people of that, so they used a lot of other methods. D.L. Moody in Chicago couldn't convince that where the Sunday school classes were started and some of the boys' homes were started to get the kids off the streets to help things out. But at some point, we were convicted by God's Spirit that we were lost and dead in trespasses and sins. Oswald Chambers once said, The surest sign that God is at work in the repentant person is when the repentant person says, I have sinned and means it. Anything less is simply sorrow for having made foolish mistakes, a reflex, act, a reflex action caused by self-disgust. If all I am doing is confessing my sins over and over and over again and sensing self-disgust in myself, I have not repented. That's not repentance. 
We are never closer to God than when we know in our heart that we are sinners before God, that we are at His mercy and His forgiveness, end quote. And so as you and I have become Christians and we have been made alive in Christ, we're not living according to the prince and the power of the air. We have repented. Not perfect, but have repented. And it's important for us to understand this in this our study. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we go into your word in verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 2, that you will help us to understand what you've laid out for us. Help us to realize that of all the things you've done for us, there's nothing greater than saving us. And that you have brought within us a new nature through your spirit and your presence. That you have brought within us the imputed righteousness that we do not deserve. That justifies us before you at all times. And we're so thankful for that imputed righteousness because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross and our simple saying yes to the, to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Father, we ask you to help us to understand your word. Help us to understand the plan you have for us. And Father, help us to understand uh, the importance of getting the word and staying with it, regardless of our changing circumstances in our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, let's look at chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, Ephesians 2, 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation, that's manner of life, in times past, and the lust of our flesh, and everybody said, oh, that wasn't me, not me, not me, that wasn't me. We'll get into that. In times past, and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. This refers to our pre-salvation days. He starts off verse 3 of chapter 2 of Ephesians with the word, Among whom? Actually, the, it's a preposition here, E-N, or our word, N. It's the preposition of being in the sphere of a circle. If you had a circle and there's prefix preposition was part of that word or just standing alone as they do at times it would be uh, an epsilon and a new or en or our word in the english in and refers to in the realm of uh our past in the realm whom also we all had our manner of life we all lived in that bubble in other words we all had the word conversation on a strophe, means manner of life, the word there for that you have there. We all had our conversation, old English word for our manner of life. We all had that manner of life. We all had it. It's an heiress passive indicative, which means there's no element of doubt. Passive, it came upon us. We didn't produce it. We were born that way, heiress tense. It was it was the train that we were on. It was the trail that we were on. If we were at point A and going to point B, it was the lost point A to point B. Know which train you're on. Are you on the lost train or are you on the salvation train? It doesn't make any difference the color of your skin, the money you make. It doesn't make any difference of your associations or religion or any preferences you and I may have. If you're not on the salvation, tra- if you're not saved, you're not on the salvation train. And those tracks do not merge. Works and salvation or works, uh, religion and salvation do not merge. They're, they're totally separate. You may have some works and religion in your salvation, but works and religion do not lead to salvation. They do not blend into salvation. There is no blending into heaven. You're either born again or you're lost. And we had our pre-salvation days. We were lost, whether we were Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, little Lord Fauntleroy, or we were wicked John. It didn't make any difference. I was lost. You were lost. So our pastor said one time in doing jail ministry, he talked to a man and he said, you must be born, you need to be saved. And the guy said, he's been saved all his life. And our pastor said, well, you've been saved too long. You have to be born again. And Paul included himself 
among whom also Paul said we all had our manner of life, our old conversation, the way we conducted ourselves. Paul includes himself. And he included the fellow Jews as well because they all thought they were better than the Gentiles, you know, which a lot of the people at Ephesus were Gentile. It was a mixed bag of people, Jews there, but a lot of Gentiles out in that region. Hellenists, as we would call them. But but, but Paul included himself and his fellow Jews, not only Gentiles, as were the majority of those at the church at Ephesus. Paul said we all had, in verse 3 of Ephesians 2, we all had our conduct of life in times past. All of us did. And that conduct was in the various lust of the, of our flesh, he says in verse 3. Epi, another preposition, epithumias. And that is, we all had our commanding desires. We didn't create the commanding desires. We were born with them. That's what people don't seem to understand. That baby is as innocent as a day is long. But inside that baby is a monster. Inside that baby is the potential to become a wonderful person or a terrible person. The potential is inside, is built in through the Adamic nature passed down through the federal head of the human race, which is Adam. And that commanding desire works its way out through ruling our flesh. The word there for flesh is sarkos, not carnal, but S-A-R-K-O-S, sarkos. And that is that which holds or contains our fleshly wants. Whether we have what we want or not is not the point. The point is the overwhelming desire within us. Rockefeller was once asked, I think back in the 20s, how much money would it take to make him rich? And he always said, a little more. Richest man in America, I think, at the time. How much money would it take to make you rich? And he said, just a little more. It doesn't that he needed more, but his old sin nature was never letting him be satisfied, would not let him be at rest. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, The eye is not filled with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. He had much, but he wanted more. So whether we have what we want or not is not the point. You might have the most beautiful wife. You might have the most handsome husband. You might, and they might have all the graces and the beauty that a man, and he might have all the charm and the looks that a woman could ever want. And there are women who will chase after somebody else. There are men who will chase after someone else. Might not be half as good a looking. Might not be half as charming. Might not have half the money. Because the old sin nature is never satisfied. Whether we have what we want or not is not the point. The point is that what is driving your life? Because it can happen to Christians too. Don't think that because you're a Christian that you won't have these desires because you do. And it makes a difference whether it's for sexual pleasure or for monetary pleasure or whatever it might be or power or the ability to get juice on somebody so you can spread gossip. Or you can find a way to make yourself look better than other people and self-righteous because it's all equally bad. There is none that rivals or is any better than the other. Okay? There is not like, well, what grade of sin would that qualify to really turn you off? Remember what I used the example of the the, the little uh, dropper thing that you used to, to pull out of the bottle and I'd do it in a in a toilet, say it's been flushed, but I do it, and just the idea, and I put it over into a drinking glass. Well, what a difference does it make if it's whether one dropper or two or three or four? You're not going to want it if it's got one dropper of something that's been pulled out of the poo water and put in your glass. Let me just say it. It's all contaminated, right? You might say, well, I'm less contaminated. Than well, God doesn't want anything that's contaminated. And the only thing that purifies and sterilizes our contaminated hearts is the blood of Christ. Nothing else will do it. So I will be very blunt and, and with people 
and, and try to get them to get the point. Because most people don't understand what a lot of ministers say because they talk so far above them in the clouds that it really never does settle in on their vernacular. They don't get what they're saying. So I, I've always said that my point is not to, uh, to make it easy, just to make it clear. Not to be mean, but to make it clear. So whether we have what we want or not is not the point. The point is that we used to live with an overwhelming desire that was within us that we didn't ask for. It was just baked into the cake, as they say. And that desire that was in us, though you may not have been looking for it, it sprung up into an idea in your mind to start thinking that if I had him or I had her or I had that, or I had this position or whatever, that it would please me. And of course it just goes on and on to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. Fornicators typically aren't satisfied with just, you know, one or two or three. They've got to have four, five, six, eight, you know, what used to say a, a lover in every port. People who are criminals or who have sticky fingers or are kleptomaniacs, it's not that they have a desire to just, you know, lift something at, at the drugstore. They have a tendency to want to lift something wherever they think there's an opportunity that they might lift something. That's the sin nature. And if you become a Christian, which I think you have, you have to ask that for yourself, that nature still can rise up in you. And me too. I'm no different than you. I'm flesh and blood just like you. It can rise up in me and I have to watch it. It can rise up in you and you have to watch it. But it was the old way of life that we once lived. And so I ask myself this question as I ask you, have I been made alive? That is, in Christ. Because our old sinful trends, we have that in common. We have a koinonia we wish we didn't have, and that is that we're all sinners. The only ones that you and I probably couldn't stand are the ones who think they're not, because we don't have a fellowship with them. <laughs> they think they're higher and mightier. But our sinful trends came to be a part of our pursuits. Okay? And the pursuit of these things, we were fulfilling, as Paul says, the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The word desires, they Lamata, T-H-E-L-E-M-A-T-A. The desires, which is another word for thalema, is another word for bulamai, is determined will. Thalema is a abiding desire. And it means the will. We were fulfilling the will of the flesh. The flesh is just meat, right? No. The flesh is ground zero for the old sin nature. When you die, you don't have an old sin nature. People who die and go to hell don't wish anything bad on anybody. They wish only good things for the people who are still here on earth, as is seen in Luke chapter 16 of the rich man who died in Hades, was sent to Hades, the torment side. Ask Abraham if you could go back and tell my brothers uh, the, the truth of Christ so that they don't, my five brothers, so they don't come down here and suffer like me. He had compassion that he never had when he was alive. He didn't have a sin nature. And so it's interesting to see that. But when we were unsaved and we were living according to the desires of the flesh and of the mind, it says here, we were also not only trying to fulfill the desires or the will of the flesh, but we were also trying to fulfill the will of our mind. The word there is dia noia. That is our thought life. And the prefix preposition dia is that which goes through. You used to hear the thing in one ear and out the other. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of stuff that goes in one ear or in one thought and out the other. But if you let it linger, some of it will start to stick. If you let something lay in the harbor uh, tied up on the dock too long, Keeping your interest too long, it will start to become a desire and it will stick and it will stay in your mind and it's hard to get it out. There is a way you can get it out. You say, I have desires that I wish I didn't have. There is a way to get those out. They're, they still have remnants, but they won't, they will not romance you. They will not overtake you. They will not over, 
overwhelm you. And that's 1 John chapter 2 and verse 8 is the answer for that. And that is to get a steady infusion of light or truth from God's Word because it will push that darkness out. It will push it out. But at that time before we were saved, our flesh and our mind belonged to the cosmic system. It belonged to this world. Our thought life was was pervasively led by the influence of our old nature. Old sin nature. And we were, as he says here in this passage in verse 3, and we were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Oh, not me. Yes, you too. (laughs) It came naturally that we were children of wrath. The word here, wrath, is our word orge. In other words, we were the target of God's righteous indignation. That's what orge anger is, of course. Righteous indignation. We were the target of God's righteous indignation because we should have been reflecting His image, but we were not. Even as others, he says. A.T. Robertson says in his uh, co- uh, commentary on this passage, God does not have this indignation with little children who know no better. So God's not angry or have righteous indignation towards someone who has not reached an age of accountability who knows better. God doesn't have that, that sense because where much is given, much is required. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. So once a person knows right from wrong, then God gets frustrated with them. Now, they're still lost, but then they become targets of His wrath. And one thing you don't want God to do is set His eye on you. Not in that way. I don't either. Because if God anthropomorphically can set His eye on you, He can also set His teeth on you. And that's a lot of people don't have a concept of God in that perspective. But it's only because they don't want to. You know, a lot of people have made God out to be some sort of a fairy tale creature. Some sort of a mythological creature. He's God. He's real. You are made after His image. Are you a mythological creature? (laughs) Are you a fairy tale? No. You're made after the image of God. You're just as real and He's just as real too. We were just as unsaved as everybody else. And I was coming up young, we'd go to the church, and we'd sing in the choir. I don't know, every once in a while I guess the gospel was preached. It wasn't a very Bible teaching type church, but good folks. But I imagine there were some of us who felt like we were better than the heathens that never went. But going to school on Sunday, on the, on Monday, we might have felt like, we might not have felt that way. I don't know. I'm just saying for me that I'm glad I go to church. I'm glad I go to a house of worship. And I might have felt like I was better than, you know, the troubled kids that was always sneaking out the side door, you know, skipping and all that stuff. People like Cindy, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Probably an A student. Sure. But I'm saying there is a propensity to feel like we're better than somebody else because, you know, we, we, we attended a religious service. I'm not saying others here haven't. But we were just as lost as everybody else. The difference is we didn't know it. Maybe they did. No one is less lost than the other person. As I said in my notes, no one is less lost than the other fellow or the other lady. When you see people in or out of church, if they are not in Christ, they are just as lost as a person who's living in the red light district who's participating in such. Or the, the greedy person on Wall Street. Or the greedy person or the, the politician who's gone off the cray-cray. If they're lost, you're just as lost as they are if you don't have Christ. We are all equally lost. Flesh is flesh is flesh. Either it's flesh or it's self-righteousness. It's still sin. And I will just put this down here. I don't know if I put this in my note here. Yeah, number two. Total depravity is an equal opportunity contaminator. That would be a good bumper sticker for your car, wouldn't it? <laughs> Total depravity is an, is an equal opportunity contaminator. Everybody is equally contaminated. In other words, the dropper has dropped on you too through, the, through Adam. 
through the genetic passing down of the gene of mankind. It's been passed on to you. You must be born again, Jesus says. Total depravity is an equal opportunity to contaminate her. And that depravity, whether it comes in the form of lasciviousness or self-righteousness, is driven to self-seeking pleasure spawned on by the genetically formed old sin nature. Yeah. Total depravity is an equal opportunity contaminator, and that depravity within us as human beings, whether it comes in the form of, of uh, loose living or lasciviousness or some called licentiousness, or on the other spectrum but the, of the same coin, self-righteous asceticism. In other words, I'll withhold from doing these things because I'm morally superior than you. I won't participate in those acts because I'm morally superior. That self-righteous looking down the nose is like the Pharisees were. They were harder to bring to Christ than the lewd Gentiles were because at least it was easy for them to recognize, yeah, I'm a sinner. But the religious crowd is often hard to convince that they're lost and going to hell because they're religious. It is the... The, uh, the dope of the masses, as some say, or the opiate of the masses. Religion. Well, one thing that Christianity is not is Christianity, though it has a form of religion, Christianity is faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a religion. It's coming to Christ for the salvation of your soul. It becomes relationship-oriented, not works or religion-oriented. But anyway... You and I can either be loose as a goose or we can be as self-righteous and uppity as possible. And we're still equally lost. Psalm 51 and verse 5. What is it it said here? Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I was shaped in iniquity. In iniquity, it's in me. And in sin was I conceived. Sin is at conception. Which means life begins at conception. Equally judged, equally human. And equally given an opportunity in life to be saved once an age of accountability has been reached. Romans 5.12 says it's passed down through Adam. We come from the womb with a nature that invokes God's wrath in time. Psalm 103 and verse 14, King David said, He knoweth our frame. And frame is the Hebrew word, yes sir, Y-E-S-E-R. Yeah. Y-E-S-E-R. And that means God knows our disposition and our inclinations. God knows our motivations. He knows what we are destined to do once we are born. One reason some believers may not fully appreciate their salvation is that they have never had any idea of how sinful they were in God's eyes before salvation. They had no idea just how condemned they were before they were saved. There are many people who say they believe Jesus Christ is the Savior. Please listen up here now. There are many people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, especially this time of year around Christmas. But they have never said to Him, I receive you as my Savior. They've never said, I receive you as my Savior. I mean, I'll personally, in their own heart, in their own words, say, Dear Jesus Christ, I receive you as my Savior. I know I can't save myself. I receive you as my Savior. There are a lot of people who believe that Jesus came and died for their sins, but they have never bowed the knee to receive Him as Savior, and thus they have never been regenerated. They have never been born again. They are still lost. Unfortunately, they are still bound for hell. 
It does no good to believe things about Jesus Christ unless you receive Him. The wonderful thing, though, is this, as he says in verse 4, But God, O day, but God who is rich in mercy, for His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. But God, hode theos is the word here. I remember former Pastor Frampton had a sermon, hode theos, but the God who is rich in mercy for his great love, his unconditional agape love with which he loved us, as per John 3 and verse 16, even when we were dead, he says in verse 5, He loved us even when we in our position were born in this world dead in sins. Romans 5, 6 through 9. We know that passage. That God loved us even when we were His enemies. He hath quickened us or made us spiritually alive. He says, Paul says here. He made us spiritually alive together with Christ. Verse 5. Then he says, by grace ye are saved. That is what is known as a paraphrastic, perfect, passive indicative of the Greek word sozo. By grace ye are saved. Here Paul resumes with his original thought in chapter 2 and verse 1, that by grace you are saved and you were lost. Even when we were dead in sin, saith he made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. The perfect tense means completed action in past time. The passive voice means you received the salvation. You didn't produce it. In perfect tense, again, it means a completed action in past time having present results. Passive voice means God produced the action in you. And the indicative mood means there's no element of doubt. That's all in that word sozo minoi right there. So here Paul resumes with his original thought in chapter 2 and verse 1. You see, unconditional love is God's motivator to save us. John 3.16 Love alone cannot save us. Jesus Christ was and still is the expression of God's love sent to die as a sacrifice on our behalf to save us. I'll say that again. Jesus Christ was and still is God's only expression of love sent to die as a sacrifice to save any of us. We were dead. That means we were spiritually cut off from God. We were in trespasses and sins, but now because of God we are made spiritually alive by means of the life that we have with Jesus Christ who has saved us through His unmerited favor. You see, we could never do enough to be saved. We could never do enough to be good enough on our own desire to merit God's mercy. None of us deserve God's mercy. None of us. So what was the favor that God showed to you and I? That Jesus, the Son of God, in dying for our sins, became our substitute paying for our offenses and trespasses against God. He says, by grace, as we close, you are saved. Again, perfect, passive, indicative, verb. Salvation here, ye are saved. By grace, ye are saved as one word, sozo manoi, from the root word sozo, S-O-Z-O, and it means you were rescued. You were rescued. You were lost and dying. You were falling and He rescued you. The old song, rescue the perishing, care for those who are dying. So by grace you're saved. God's mercy is withholding from us judgment that we fully deserved. And that mercy is much deeper and greater than our sin. So God's divine justice needing to be satisfied, motivated by His unconditional love sent Christ from heaven who took up a human body as Jesus of Nazareth to live among us, sinless all the way to the cross, where there He was crucified for our sins. And there all of our sins were poured out on Him on the cross. An idol such as Diana could not save. Money cannot save. 
People cannot save you. Religion cannot save you or I. And an idol such as was in, in so influential of the culture of that day in Ephesus, such as Diana, she could not save anyone. As we noted a couple lessons back, these false gods cannot speak. They cannot see. They cannot hear. They cannot smell. They do not hear. They do not understand. They do not hear or walk. They are dead. False gods are just chunks of wood and metal fashioned into an image by the imagination of wicked people. These idols cannot love you. They cannot sacrifice for you. They'll do nothing for you. If something is to be idolized, it should be worth being idolized. And no human being is worth being idolized. No human being. American idol or not, no human being is worthy to be idolized because you're just a sinner falling down in front of another sinner. Don't be stupid. I know you're not, but I'm saying don't go off the cray-cray there. Please note that by grace you're saved. Perfect tense, passive voice. Sesos minoi, the word there, the 50 cent word for S-O-Z-O. It means our salvation by this verb is completed fully in Christ. There is not one thing that is your part in getting saved. Not one bit in your part. To have positive volition to receive Christ is not a work. Belief is not a work. It's simply acceptance of something else. And in this case, the work of Christ. There's no element of doubt in the indicative mood of this word of being saved. And that means not only is there no element of doubt that you are saved when you receive Christ, but there's no element of doubt that your salvation is eternal. It's not salvation if it's not eternal. It's not called eternal. Pro, it's not called Jesus offers probation. It's salvation. He saves us by his sacrifice for us on the cross of Calvary. So the importance, as I had on our questions there, the importance of the perfect passive voice of the indicative mood of the verb you are saved. Perfect tense is completed. Your salvation is complete. Passive voice. It's paid for by Christ. You didn't work for it. Indicative mood. All this is in that same little stem and that word there. Indicative mood. It's no element of doubt. It's a mood of certainty. So that's that's important in understanding that. We have all that because we are in Christ. And we wouldn't have anything else if it were not for Him and what He's done for us. There has been a change in us. We're not perfect but we have been perfected forever in Christ. And now we seek to be more like Him and become more like Him uh, through uh, the transformation of our mind and the transformation of our lives and our conformity to the character of Christ. It's a privilege. And it's a privilege to be able to share that message with the world and with others around us that we know. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day and for Your kindness to us for your watch care over us, for your love, your motivator. We know that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we know that we are all sinners condemned, not because we wanted it to be that way, but it's just the way that it is. We were born that way. And so we thank you that the message comes through clear, especially through our Savior, when Jesus told Nicodemus, the religious man, that you must be born again. That's by believing on Jesus Christ, believing that you're, you're, you're not going to save yourself, that only He can save you. By receiving Him as our Lord and Savior, where we are given, through His sacrifice, we are given eternal life. Thank you for that blessing. And thank you for the Word that gives us the strength to live each day in the power of that blessing. Thank you again for each one that's come out. We ask your blessings upon them. We ask your blessings upon those poor souls out in Kentucky and other places that were uh, recipients of that tornado yesterday, the other night, 
We ask your protection for those who are working to try to rescue the ones that may still be alive. And we pray for the souls of those who have gone on. We can't do anything for them anymore. Uh, we all realize that we're appointed to once uh, to die, and then our judgment day is ahead of us. And so, Father, we pray that the souls, so many were saved prior to that time. We pray that there might be souls saved as a result of people thinking about their life uh, being spared. And so, Father, we just ask for your grace in the cleanup and in the, uh, the needs of those people. Thank you again for this day. and Thank you again for your mercy. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.